Brill. Guys, you did great on those lists. Um, but I wonder, I would like us to think for a little bit, and children, maybe you might be able to help me with this. Um, all the, a lot of these good guys and bad guys are from films and things. But I wonder, do we ever see around us, maybe at school or at work or in our community, do we see people that we think of as goodies and baddies? And what kind of names, what kind of names might we give to people that come across as baddies? What do you reckon? We've got Hawk Moth, yeah, but what about, can we think of maybe, without, I don't want names, but in our lives, are there people around us that kind of we think of, oh, they're not so nice, maybe baddie smilter? Bullies, yeah, I had that one in mind. So we sometimes say, we might call people bullies. Sophia? Okay, hunters, yeah. Yeah? Enoch, have you got an idea? Uh, we, we did get Hawk Moth. Yeah, that's brilliant. Lots of people want to put Hawk Moth up. He is a really horrible baddie, I know. Uh, any, I wonder if anyone else has any... Like, Think of maybe in the news or in our lives some of the words that maybe are used to describe people that maybe our society looks down on uh, or leaves out. Maxine, have you got an idea? Defendants, yeah. Um... We might sometimes, I don't know if you hear in the news sometimes of people that they're called, they say like scroungers uh, or la kind of implying that people are lazy and just getting something for nothing. Go on, Sophia. You're not sure? Don't worry. I, okay, what about goodies? Think of the people at school that your teachers are saying, oh, they're really good. Yeah, okay, thanks. <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> What kind of words might we use to describe what we might see in our society as goodies, Enoch? Apple. Yeah, they, they, we, we can tell people, we, we know lots of people that we think are great, I know. But have we got any, yeah. Uh, yeah, like loving people, yeah, great. Sophia, what? Yeah, uh, great, one of your friends. Maybe should we put friends just to cover all of them? Um, yesterday at this show, Sophia and I were watching. The girl w at the show was struggling because she was always kind of obedient. She was always doing the right thing. And she learned that actually sometimes it's okay to stand up for, for yourself uh, and to step out. But we might think of that. We might talk about someone being well behaved. So it, what I want us to see is in our, on TV we see goodies and baddies. But also in our lives we might think of people as goodies and baddies. And I wonder if bad guys can ever change. Sadly, Sophia stole my surprise, but I did have a trailer for a film that we saw. Oh, actually, I think but you're going to have to wait for the, tra for the film, because first... No, I know, it's fine, it's fine. It was because you were thinking that on the same line as me. Before we have our little film... If you want to watch the little film, we're going to listen carefully first. So Maxine's going to come and read to us from Mark 15. It's on page, is it 1,023? Yeah, it's on page 1,023 if you want to grab a church Bible and look it up. Morning. Um, so the, yeah, as you've heard, the reading is on page 1,023. Mark chapter 15, verses 33 to 41. Um, and the uh, verses is titled, The Death of Jesus. Verse 33. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, Listen, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. 
With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, Surely this man was the Son of God. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the younger and of Joseph, and Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there. This is the word of the Lord. So, can bad guys ever change? I'm just going to show you a little trailer of a film we watched a few weeks ago. Yeah, if you want to watch, move around. Okay. Oh, careful, careful. You're right, Lydia. Yeah. Do you want to come and sit? If you want to watch, you want to sit on this mat or on these chairs. Okay. Hey, you. Get over here. Oh, I know what it is. You're afraid because I'm the big bad wolf. The villain of every story. Duh. And this is the crew. Miss Tarantula. Mr. Shark. Mr. Piranha. Mr. Snake. Everyone copy. 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 We're the bad guys. It's crime time, baby. Shark. We need a distraction. Do I get to improvise? Fine. Please be subtle. I'm having a baby! Is there a doctor? Or perhaps several security guards that could leave their post and help me? We were never given a chance to be anything more than criminals. But these are the cards we've been dealt, so we might as well play them. Here, let me help you. Are you okay, ma'am? Thank you, dear. You're such a good boy. Wait, what? what? I'm the bad guy. All good, brother? All good, yeah, yeah. You ever wonder what it'd be like if the world wasn't scared of us? Never gonna happen. Guys, we're gonna go good. Did you get hit on the head? These villains have an image problem. You need a makeover. So criminal. Well, there goes our street cred. Well, I'm tired of being an outcast. Maybe I don't want to be a... What? A bad guy? You're going to have to choose between your friends or the good life. They're the only friends I have ever had. You have a chance to write your own story. What have you got to lose? I don't know. My dignity? Yeah, well... That ship has already sailed. So you're a tough guy, like you're really rough guy. That is an animal testing lab with helpless guinea pigs. I'll rescue them. You've never volunteered for anything. Oh. Come on, Snake, open up. Relax. These doors are complicated. Snake! Are you kidding me? We're supposed to save them, not eat them? Well, I'd say they've gone to a better place. I'm not that type. I'm not that type. I need it. You, I, I'll give you yours in a minute. Okay, hold it for a bit. Um, can bad guys turn good? Are our lists as simple as this? I wonder, where would God be? Would we put God as a goodie or a baddie? A goodie, we reckon. Who would God love? Would God love the goodies? Or the baddies? What do you reckon? Both. Both. Okay, maybe. We are talking about what is God like. Now, when Jesus was around, the Romans had a really helpful way of telling who was a baddie. A really, really bad guy. The kind of guy you wanted to turn your nose up. You wanted nothing to do with. The way the Romans knew who was a bad guy, was by the cross. The people, the Romans on the cross, were definitely 100% bad guys. Now, God 
Lydia, I'm going to need... Lydia, are you listening? Because in, in a minute, I've got something for you to do. So listen carefully. God became a human called Jesus. And Jesus went around loving everyone. Jesus uh, loved even the people who might have been seen as the bad guys. Jesus loved everyone. Jesus showed us that God loves everyone, but this got people annoyed because people didn't think God loved the bad guys. So they teamed up with the Romans and they ended up putting Jesus on a cross. And I don't know if you heard in the story that Maxine read to us, but when Maxine read that Jesus died, the centurion, a Roman soldier, said, wow, surely this was the Son of God. The Roman centurion realized that these categories were wrong, that Jesus, that they called a bad guy, was actually good. And it said the curtain was torn in two. Now, the curtain was a really big, thick curtain that kept people out from God's presence, not just the baddies, but everyone, only the most holy of people could go to God, and it was torn apart. And Jesus didn't stay on the cross, but he came alive to show us that the people that maybe we think are bad are still loved by God. He changed the cross from a sign of who was bad to a sign that no one was too bad. We're all welcome in God's family. So, children, if you think you're bad sometimes, if we think we've let people down, if we feel upset with how we've behaved, if we feel abandoned and left out, we're not too bad for God. Because the cross shows us that wherever we are, or whoever we are, I can give them out in just a minute, okay? Yeah, you can. The cross shows us that God has opened a way for all of us to come near. So I've made... Um, Smilter, Enoch, other, everyone, you might want to have a little look at what I've made, because I'm going to get you to make one of these. I've made a cross, and on the cross I've torn a bit of gold card. Girls, are you listening? Because you won't know what to do. I've torn a bit of gold card to represent the curtain, and I've put some flowers to represent the new life that Jesus brings up. And I'm wondering if you can make it even better than mine. Maybe you can decorate the cup. Can you make a cross, a torn curtain, to show us that when Jesus dies, he gives new life to everyone. All right, so Sophia and Lydia, are you going to take those bags for people? Um, And I'd love to see your crosses at the end as you think about how everyone has a space to belong in God's family. So what is... God like. Two weeks ago, Ellie spoke to us about how God was like a dance. This incredible relationship with God's self, but relationship that was open to us and to the world. Last week, Andy shared that God is like a father. A father who makes a disgrace of himself to run with love towards us. And do you know what? This whole series, we know what God is like. Not because we've managed to figure it out. Not because we're clever enough to get a hold on who God is. But because God has made God known. God has become Jesus so that we could know who God is. And in our reading today, in the climax of the Jesus story, that God hangs on a cross. The cross that was a sign to all of shame and repulsion. Those who were deemed unworthy of any place in society hung upon the cross. Those who had been stripped of all their human rights hung upon the cross. Those who we should strive to be nothing like hung upon the cross. And this is where our God hangs. This is where God reveals to us in the biggest way possible who God is. Today, friends, we live in a world where basic human rights are still under threat. It's been in the news this week 
the way that women are being deprived of their rights, their rights to have autonomy over their body. Friends, this is a controversial, it's a complex issue. But whatever you feel about the specifics, there is an agenda, mostly from white men, to hold power over women and other minorities. And in our nation too, our government is determined to remove rights from those they deem unworthy. Whether it's the members of the LGBTQ community, whether it's women, whether it's immigrants seeking refuge, whether it's those from less well-off backgrounds, whether it's those with learning disabilities, time and again, people's rights, those who are other, those who are different, their rights are threatened. And it's easy for us sometimes to buy into that language, to see someone as other, as less deserving of rights than us. Well, how will we respond? Well, as we turn to our Bible story, you can read the whole chapter 15. Mark is so clever. Everything in the story is there for a purpose. He weaves together this tale to tell us some remarkable things. First of all, we notice that the crucifixion of Jesus takes place outside the city, away from the religious center, away from the place of belonging. Jesus has become an outsider. But more than that, because we might have sympathy for outsiders, but Jesus hangs on the cross and becomes a repugnant, shamed, defeated, weak criminal. So the title of my talk today is that God is like a criminal. Because a criminal is a word that we still use to mark out one who is unworthy. They are the class, perhaps, that we find easiest to look down on, to deprive of their rights. And it's not to say that we should overlook terrible crimes that have been committed. It's not to say that wrongdoing is not real and terrible. But criminal becomes a label, an identity. And God becomes a criminal to challenge us about who we might cast aside. This is so profound, so abnormal, so world turned upside down that Mark says darkness covers the earth and Jesus cries, where is God? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This amazing theologian, Jürgen Moltmann, who lived through the war, a German theologian who's still alive today, calls this the eschatological cry of God-forsakenness by the Son of God. What does that mean? Well, it means that even if, just for a moment, Jesus does not believe. Jesus, God is forsaken by God. The dance of God is broken. God is like an unbeliever. Jesus dies forsaken by God. And what follows? Well, the first person to speak is a Roman centurion, an outsider, not one of God's people, but an enemy. And he declares that surely this was the son of God. And the curtain is torn. The curtain in the temple marked where God was and where only the most holy of priests could tread. The curtain was torn because the holy God has gone to the darkest place, the most forsaken place, the place of the criminal, the despairing, the atheist, the shamed and the destitute, to bring hope to all without hope. Again, Jürgen Moltmann puts it like this, in the cross of the Son of God, in his abandonment by God, the crucified God is the God of all godless men, or all godless people, and those who have been abandoned by God. Moltmann also tells us that this abandonment, this despair, permanently marks the dance of God. The cross is at the heart of God now and forever to show us that God, God's self was forsaken by God so that there is room for every one of us. This week, this was really real for me. Um, I, I've been getting really tired recently and when I'm tired I struggle sometimes with my mental and emotional health and I felt abandoned and lost. A couple of days ago I was struggling with these feelings and I struggle even more because I think as a vicar should I feel abandoned by God? Surely that's not right. But I did and I cried out to God. I said, God, 
Show yourself to me. Where are you, God, in my pain and in my abandonment and in my hurting? And friends, no booming voice came. No bright light in the sky. Only silence. But the next morning, I took a walk. And I found a glimpse, just a glimpse of God in the faces of my neighbours who stopped to speak to me. And I found a glimpse of God in this flower. This flower that was growing from the crack in the pavement. I was still struggling, but I was found by God, even in this most simple and most simple of things. Are you hopeless? Have you written yourself off? Are you in despair and abandoned? God crosses the line, crosses this line to be with you. God pushes through the pavement in colour and life to be your God too. Will you let the cross, the God who becomes a criminal, an outcast, a doubter and an unbeliever, will you let the cross change you? Will you let yourself today be found by this God? And will you cross the line to someone else? We don't just talk about inclusion and diversity in a wider table here at Christ Church because we want more people in our church. We do it because we believe that God has become crucified one. That God also has raised Jesus, the crucified one, from the dead. So wherever we draw a line to say who is in and who is out, wherever we believe it's okay to be silent in the face of those who would deprive minority groups of their rights, wherever we exclude for any reason, we see Jesus always beyond the boundary we have drawn, calling us to be more loving, to be more generous, to see God in the faces of the other, calling us to make room for them. Other parts of the Bible and theology tell us that when Jesus died, he descended into the very depths of the place we call hell. It tells us that he ripped the gates of hell from their gateposts, that he overcame sin and death and hell once and for all. He went to the furthest and the darkest corners of our universe to pursue you and me and every one of us. So it must be our prayer and it can be our hope that one day every hell will be empty because of the power of the self-giving, self-emptying love of God that might win. And while we wait for that day, that day when sin and death and hell and tears are done away with, while we wait, there are three things I'd love to encourage you to do today. Remember that you are loved. God joins you in your abandonment. God joins you in your pain. God joins you in your despair and your fear and your hopelessness. Let's cry out for and reach the abandoned. Who around us does not yet know that they are truly loved? How can we pray for them? Crying out to God and how can we reach out? And how can we join Jesus in the pursuit of justice? that smashes every boundary that excludes. We do it through the cross, because in the cross, God has shown us once and for all that God is on the side of the outsider, the criminal, the doubter, the unbeliever, the atheist, the foreigner. And God is on our side. And in raising Jesus from the dead, God has shown us that hopelessness will not continue forever, that we have a place in the heart of God.